Good morning. Uh, this week uh, we are going to look at one of the other attributes of God. Uh, so far we've moved from God's goodness to His justice to His mercy. And this week we're going to look at grace. But first I kind of wanted to, to talk briefly about why this order. Um, the, the question becomes, you know, we talk about grace and grace is of utmost importance in the believer's life. And yet, it's week four. And so I, I kind of want to go through some of the reasoning and why we're moving through it in this order. Um, one of the big things we talk about with God's goodness is that we, uh, we look at it in terms of His greatness, His attributes that are, are great, things that we normally attribute to the Old Testament, the omnis, you know, in terms of God being omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. He's all powerful, all knowing. He's everywhere at once. Uh, you know, there's we we typically look at the Old Testament and think about God's power, and then the New Testament and think about God's heart. And yet, the same God of the Old Testament it carries on through in the incarnation of Jesus, and it's the same God. There's no difference from then to now, and how He interacts with people doesn't really change that much. We see in Jesus a reframing of people's perspective of who God is. And yet all the things that Jesus said are evident in the Old Testament. And so instead of dividing it up into there's the powerful, wrathful, vengeful God in the Old Testament and the loving Jesus in the New Testament, we want to look at God's character all the way through all those attributes, these things we've talked about, His goodness so far, His justice, His mercy, and today His grace and graciousness. Uh, leading all the way through from Old Testament to New Testament. These are the immutable qualities of God, and there are more. Um, but the order of these, um, going from His goodness, everything is predicated on God's goodness, how He interacts with His people, and how He is benevolent and predisposed, or just disposed, not predisposed, disposed to look kindly upon His creation and act in a way to benefit His creation that He has made, because that is... Um, God's nature being good, His love, His mercy, um, His compassion, His graciousness, they all flow out of that. Uh, his justice also flows out of that, as we talked about just, God's justice uh, a, few, a couple weeks ago. And so, um, looking through that, we have God's goodness, but then also um, attention that people think is there, which we don't really see um, God feeling uh, in the same way. But attention that we perceive today, especially today, uh, of God's goodness and His justness being at odds. And we talked a little bit about His justness being that God is going to do what He says He's going to do. That it is um, kind of akin to faithfulness. God says it and has deemed it right, and therefore He is going to act upon that. Um, and we see Moses reminding God of that over and over when he says, Ask God to relent. And God does because of His justness, his fidelity to his own words. Um, so we have his goodness, his justness, which sets up a standard of who we're going to be. And we'll talk about that standard a little bit next week in God and perfection and God's holiness you know, over the next couple of weeks. Um, it sets up an expectation. And then in that expectation, it is completely good and completely fair, uh, though we use fairness in a little bit different terms, um, for God to ask these things of us is completely right um, because He is the one who has created us. He has set the universe into being, and He made it a certain way, which sin had broken. And so He is calling us to live in that certain way. It is just and right. Um, but in response to that justness, He looks upon us in His mercy, which again has been there from the beginning. It's not just a response. Um, but He looks upon us in His mercy and says, This is a people who cannot change their situation. That the power to change our position with Him is not found within us. And so in His mercy, uh, I know this is a term that I used last week that many of us take offense at being called pitiful or pitiable, um, but God looked upon us and said, we do not have the power within ourselves to make a change. Therefore, He steps in and makes a change. We see it in the Old Testament. Uh, we looked at that, uh, I believe, last week. Um, we looked at Jonah, uh, where he said, These are a people in Nineveh who do not know when God is talking to Jonah, their right hand from their left hand. We see Jesus talking about it and also referencing back to Isaiah, 
where we are a people, we are sheep without a shepherd. We don't know. And so we see Jesus reframing this throughout his ministry of, of who God is. You are called to be God's people. Um, and so he is the shepherd who is leading us that way. And that imagery is used in both Paul and Peter as well, talking about who we are and how Jesus is our head. And so uh, moving from there, we've got his mercy. And today we're going to talk about his grace. And his grace is a similar response with mercy, but but I want to I want to differentiate those a bit. And a lot of people say, why are we getting this deep into the weeds with differentiating them? Well, mercy is because of our situation and our station. It is because we are unable to effect change in and of ourselves. And God steps in. Well, grace is a little bit different. It is part of that response, but because of God's mercy. Uh, he has to accept something from us and extend grace to us because through his goodness and his mercy he has decided to effect change for us he also has to accept debt from us and that's where we see grace it is his response directed towards human debt that we owe him see we were created in perfection we were created as perfect god uh, declared when he created Adam that it was good, good. It was um, wholly good. It was fully, fully good. Um, and yet, through sin, we have created a chasm between us. Um, through sin, we have pursued ourselves in our own kingdoms, our own uh, places and our own good, and have abandoned the good that has been set out by God, the perfection that was set out with God, by God, the completeness that was set out by God, pursued ourselves, and there is something that we owe him as our creator. Um, that call to be just, to be perfect, and that leaves, that leaves a balance there. So in his mercy, he is moved because we cannot make that change. But in his grace, he has to extend um, payment, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, and there's lots of different ways talking about Jesus' sacrifice, but he has to extend that on our behalf. Um, and we see it not just in the New Testament in Jesus, and we'll talk about that, but in the Old Testament as well. And so, grace. Uh, you know, grace demonstrates that God doesn't deal with people based on their worthiness, um, but only on their need. Um, while we were yet sin sinners, Christ died for us. And so we had a need um, to be reconciled, to be restored, and God dealt with us based on that. Um, not because we have made ourselves good, not because we have done enough. It hasn't been accounted to us as righteousness because we have done enough. Instead, um, it's because we have allowed God to move in those places. Um, and there's some, some scriptural references there that we'll kind of get into. Um, and all of this is, His grace is extended um, to meet our need based on His goodness, His generosity, and his mercy. Um, see, God doesn't require anything from us. He doesn't require those things for us to make him complete, and yet we owed him, and we require so much from him, and so he deals with our need, not his need. Uh, I want to read uh, first from Exodus 34, 6, a very common passage most of us know. Um, if you've been reading in the Bible for very long, this is Moses hearing uh, and seeing uh, seeing God for as much as anyone could see God, um, because he asked God to show him his glory, and we'll get to that story in just a second. Um, but this is what God says about himself as he moves past. It's, it's God's proclamation of himself. It says that he, he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord of, is the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. Um, it's funny, we see in here um, God's goodness um, being compassionate. Um, we see and disposed to us. We see God's mercy um, slow, being slow to anger and abounding in love. We see God's justice um, not leaving the guilty unpunished. 
And we see God's grace, saying that he is gracious and he is forgiving wickedness, not based on what we deserve, but on our need. And so God, uh, we see all these qualities here in God's declaration of who he is. And so moving back a little bit to um, this backstory of it, it, in Exodus 33, uh, we have a picture of, of God being angry and how he deals with his people that leads up to uh, Moses asking to see God's glory. So in Exodus 33, um, 19, and, or Exodus 33, and we'll kind of get through, verse 19 is something that's quoted um, by, God, or by Paul in Romans uh, about God saying, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. It's in Romans 9. And I will have grace, I'll be gracious to whom I want to be gracious to. Um, it's, it's a quote from Exodus 33, so I want to tie that in. Paul said that, I mentioned it last week in Romans 9, uh, 15, but he's quoting from Exodus uh, 33. So uh, let's get to the story. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. This is God doing what he said he was going to do. He promised, he covenanted with them. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you, because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, You are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. In verse 7, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the Tent of Meeting. Anyone require, inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered. As Moses went into the tent, a pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face, as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. So in verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, Teach me your way, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. We've seen multiple times where Moses refers back to um, his people. God reminding God that this is your people. God has said, okay, go do, so far, go do what I've promised to do, but I'm not going to be with you because my anger burns against you. You have rebelled. You have done all of these things that I've, I've told you not to do. And so I, I just can't be around you. And as a parent, I have those moments too, right? I say, I, I just can't be here right now because if I'm here, I'm going to react in anger. Most of us have had that in our relationships. And so God is essentially telling the people, no, he is telling the people, I can't be around you because I may destroy you. Because what you have done goes so contrary to what I've laid out for you. And this is God's justice. Um, he's afraid that he's going to react, that he's going to respond in a way um, that just wipes them out. And so we hear Moses pleading before the Lord, as he does many times, and saying, remember, these are your people, um, so help us, don't abandon us. Um, and so uh, Moses continues on, or the Lord continues on and replies to him in verse 14. The Lord replied, my presence is will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then Moses says, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me, distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you 
and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me uh, where you may stand on a rock. Uh, when my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. And so we have in verse 19, it's, it's written a, a slightly different way. And when Paul quotes it in Romans, it, it says, I will have grace. I will be gracious to whom I want to be gracious to. Um, here it has compassion. And so those two are are linked in this way. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, uh, as mentioned in both places. Um, but here we have God's compassion. I, God declaring, I will do what I will do. Uh, Moses has reminded him of the covenant that he has made with these people, and God says, I will do what I will do, because in God's justness, His justice, He is in, well within His rights to wipe out these people. They will no longer be His people. He will go find others. And He, he has said so. Um, he says, fine, y'all go do it. I, I'm, I'm not going to be with you. And Moses said, we want you, I want, Moses is declaring, I want you to be with us. If you're not going to go with us, then don't send us. Um, we can do nothing apart from you. And so God relents and says, okay, I will go with you. But know this, that I will have mercy where I will have mercy. I will be gracious. I will be compassionate where I want to be compassionate. And so he's, he's reminding of, of his grace and his mercy and his compassion, but he's also telling Moses, I will do what I will do. And so grace works this way, that, that God will do what he will do. And he is, he, because it is a part of who he is, he will be gracious. I mean, um, think about all the, it's not based on what people have, have earned. It's not because the Israelites were so great that God said, okay, I'm going to go with you. No, it's in his anger, he responded, fine, I will go with you, um, because this is part of who I am. And so we see that in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, so many different spots where uh, people were not set up, they were not shown God's favor because of what they earned, what they were worth, how they were put together. Instead, um, God chose someone, and he went from there. I mean, think about Abraham, um, Abram, uh, before his name got changed, where he was. We have no backstory on Abram. It's not because um, he had such great favor uh, from the Lord. And we, we do see that with a few people. You know, Noah, Noah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord when everybody else wasn't. And so God preserved him and preserved, uh, his, uh, preserved a, a people through him. Um, but with Abram, you see Abram wasn't doing anything. He was just, um, he was just there. Uh, and God called him and told him to move. And Abram moved. And maybe it's a sensitivity to what God has asked him to do, that God said, go, and Abram went. And uh, so maybe that's part of where he had found favor, but it wasn't because of anything that Abram had done. Uh, you look at uh, any of the, the prophets that we have, the Old Testament prophets, um, there's not any of them who have done great things, and God said, that guy seems well-reasoned, he seems well-liked, I'm going to use that person. No, most of them... Uh, when God asked them to serve, said, no, I want no part of this. I mean, think about last week with, with Jonah. Uh, Jonah didn't want any part of it because he had anger in his heart toward a whole people. And he was actually angry after he had done the thing that God had asked him to do. And still walked away saying, wouldn't it be better if I died instead of going and proclaiming who you are to this people, these guys? Uh, God, God chooses people and often chooses people who don't warrant anything. Rahab was a prostitute and yet... Um, she recognized who God was and that these were God's people whenever she hid uh, the spies. And, and God, it shows, says later on that God counted it to her as righteousness. Um, but there's nothing about Rahab that would have earned her a spot with God. There's, there's nothing that she could earn. And yet God extended his grace in using her and even counting her in a lineage that leads, uh, leads down to um, Jesus. You know, her, her name is listed in there. Uh, we have... Uh, Jeremiah, who told God, no, I don't want to do this. And God 
One of my favorite uh, passages uh, in Jeremiah is where God says, Do not be afraid before them. Uh, don't be afraid of them, or I will terrify you before them. Um, and so he's a reluctant prophet who doesn't want to speak, and God says, I will do this for you. And he still says no, and God says, Okay, I'm, I'm going to put my foot down. You are going to do this. Um, Moses was a murderer. Um, he... Uh, had gone and run away from his responsibility. I mean, there's there's so many things about him that God shouldn't have called him, and, and he hadn't earned anything, and yet God called this person and redeemed him. And that's what we see in grace. We see God choosing someone, not because of who they are, not because of what they have achieved, but instead choosing someone and redeeming them and changing them. Uh, and that's the beauty of grace. I mean, even Mary, uh, in the New Testament, Jesus' mother, all it says is, you have found favor. Uh, you know, an angel appeared to her and says, you have found favor uh, from the Lord, highly favored. And it wasn't because of anything she had done. It's because God chose to give her favor uh, through grace. Uh, and so uh, we see this over and over and over, this pattern in uh, the scriptures, that because of who God is, he gives because of who he is, not um, because of what someone has earned. And that is grace. He sees the debt. He sees the distance between him and someone else. And he closes that distance and, and extends grace to them. Um, and none of this, again, is, is because of what we have done. If you read Romans uh, eleven six, it says, I asked then, um, this is Paul writing, did God reject his people? You know, they had been put in Babylonian captivity at some point, a little bit further down the road from our our story of Moses uh, there in Exodus. Um, down, down the road they had done many things that had been wrong in the sight of the Lord. And they had gone, been taken away, they had been besieged in lots of places. Um, at the time of, of, of Jesus, the Romans had put them in captivity and were controlling everything. And we see, um, we see a people who Jesus comes to and they reject him as well. And, and so Paul is asking this question, you know, the whole book of Romans is part of reconciling the Jewish believer and the non-Jew, um, the Gentile believer, and, and bringing those two together. And in Romans 11, he says, I asked then, did God reject his people? By no means, I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham, and we'll get into Paul just in a moment, from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people, um, whom he foreknew, sorry, this is verse 2, um, don't you know that scripture says, and the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel, um, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace by grace, not because of what they have done. They've done bad things, and yet God, God had remained, or had set apart a side as a remnant. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. This is verse 6, Romans eleven six. If it were grace, if it were based on works, grace would no longer be grace. If it was because of something I've done, it would no longer be grace. It would no longer be um, a part of God's character and who He is, and operating in that um, in response to our need. Instead, it would be based on my own works. Uh, the, the description that we have uh, of Paul in Philippians uh, says, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if, anyone, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Uh, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. I mean, Paul, for all the people who don't need God's grace, Paul was doing it right. He knew he was doing it right, and, and he didn't need God. There was no debt there because he was doing it all correctly. And yet, he comes back and says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all all things. I consider them garbage, rubbish, and in other words, I won't get into, that I may gain Christ. Um, see, Paul had done everything right, and yet the debt was still there. Um, the need was still there to be reconciled and redeemed. 
he had done everything humanly possible, imaginable, uh, to make sure that his debt was paid off and yet it was still there. Because God's standard was way above what we could do. Again, that's extending mercy. But God extended grace to pay that standard. And so, even though he uh, had worked it all out, God still needed to extend his grace. It says, grace necessitates faith as an attitude in the believer. Because grace from outside of our own efforts requires us to trust outside of our own efforts. Because it comes from outside of us. We must trust outside of us. Um, therefore, the promise comes by faith, uh, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have faith, have the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all, everyone who has faith. It may be by grace and guaranteed to everyone, not based on what we do. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15.10, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet I, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Um, the grace was moving, not the effort on the part of Paul. Um, Paul was, had a lot of, uh, he'd been laid out and, and said, yes, he has authority in this. Um, and so, but he attributed all of that to God's grace, not based on what he had done. Because Granted, he's a, he's a high standard, and yet he still needs the great, same grace that you and I need today. Um, he extends forgiveness not because of our merit. This is grace. Where mercy is his extension of grace while we are pitiful, his grace is extended forgiveness despite how we treat God. Um, this, more than mercy, seems to be the contrast with his justice. Where we deserve, he gives us something else. Where I... Um, deserve death, he brings life. If we receive what we deserve, then we are dead. And yet, God is gracious, um, despite what we deserve. Um, again, mentioning Jonah from last week, the things that were deserved by the people of Nineveh, there were awful things going on there. And yet, God extended his grace to them. To hear the redemptive uh, story about how God feels, the warning um, to turn and to change. Um, we've heard the same story, and again, it's not based on us. Uh, I know uh, we just assume I'm going to get here, but Ephesians 2, um, for it is by uh, faith you have, or by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works, um, lest anyone should boast. That it is through our faith that is given from God to us to believe and to follow. And it's through His grace, not anything that comes from within us. So grace is important because it comes from outside. So the question is, you know, we talk about mercy, we talk about justice, we talk about goodness. Um, what do we do with God's grace? And the simple answer is to go and walk in it and be happy. Um, but I think there's a, a few practical things that we can do in response to God's grace for us. Um, number one, we need to end our striving. I mean, what is it that you're working for? The things that you do, are they to gain more favor with God? To somehow up your, uh, your balance on the scales to make, make your sides stack up against the wrong that you do? Or is it a response, a loving response, an obedient response to the grace that's been extended? If someone has paid off my debt, if someone has extended this grace, no matter what I have done, do I not owe them allegiance in response? Do you live in fear of the other shoe dropping? Are you worried about when God's going to make everything go wrong again? Uh, when He's going to uh, judge you and, and condemn you? I mean, do you live in fear that, um, that somehow what you're doing is not enough, and so God at some point is going to hold you to account and cause everything to go bad. It's, this is almost like karma. At some point, everything's going good, so something must happen. Well, that's not the balance of God. The balance of, if you were going to go with the balance, is we sinned, we deserve death, and yet God doesn't work in that balance. He provides life through Jesus Christ. The grace that, while we, again, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and allows us to be reconciled to God. 
Uh, next, one of the other things, treat, you know, we end our striving, our, our working for grace. Um, we need to respond to grace. And yet, and, and next, uh, we need to treat others with grace, not because they deserve it. In Matthew 5, Jesus said, You have heard that it is said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are you not even, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Um, treating others with grace is not sitting in room and saying, I'm going to give respect when I get respect. I had students uh, when I was a teacher who would say such things, and, and I asked them, doesn't that just leave you in a room, if everybody feels this way, doesn't that leave you in a room full of people who are all waiting for somebody to show respect? Um, and that causes everybody to be angry. They're, they're not going to give respect unless they give it, or they get it. Um, and that is a problem. God, because he has extended his grace to us when we don't deserve it, so are we commanded to extend grace to others when they don't deserve it. It means I, I'm not offended when somebody responds in a way that I don't like. Instead, I'm going to extend grace. I'm going to proclaim truth. I'm going to bring peace. And maybe some correction that needs to happen in there. There may be some, some conversations that need to happen in there. But judgment can't happen in my heart if I'm extending grace. Um, whether they deserve it or not. My responses are going to be different instead of being angry. And we say, oh, I don't hate people. I'm just mad, with, I'm mad at them. Well, with grace, you're not allowed to be mad at them and until you've reconciled things, until you've walked down that path. Um, grace is is commanded to be extended by us to others um, here. And then the, the last part is to live at peace in the sufficiency of God's grace. For many of us, grace isn't enough. We need God's grace. Sure, that's great, but I need something else. Uh, and in, uh, in the New Testament days, there was, we need signs, we need miracles, and there's still a call for that right now and, and for, from a lot of folks. And it, and there is, God, we need demonstrations of you working and moving. Um, but so many of us want grace and comfort. We want grace and consistency. We want grace and a life that allows me to do what I want to do. And that's not grace. Uh, listen to what Paul says uh, about his thorn, right? I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to a paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weakness." Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest in me. Um, that is why, or rest on me, that is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So many people want grace and authority, grace and uh, as I said before, comfort. They want grace, God's grace, absolutely. But they don't want to turn themselves over to God. Is His grace sufficient for you in life? Where if everything else is going wrong, if things uh, don't work out the way that you want them to work out, is His grace sufficient? The knowledge that God, in, in all of His character, has extended, um, extended uh, a payment, has, has given you his son when you needed him.
that God responded out of your need um, to fill that need. Is that enough? Grace is an important thing in the Christian life. Uh, it is is something that we a word that we use a lot, and yet when we think about how we live our lives, it doesn't end up being central. Um, when we talk about God's grace, we limit it to Jesus, and yet God the Father has been graceful to His people forever. Even the fact that that we are sustained, that we carry on, you know, as the Lord tarries, as it says. Um, his grace fills our needs. Um, and so this week, I ask that you rest in that grace, that it would, you would find it sufficient when all the other troubles of the world are going on, that you can confess to the Lord that His grace is enough. And then extend that grace to others um, as you go about your lives.